Record. All right, and, Record. For, and the next most important thing is what? Joke. The joke, very good. All right. <laughs> what do you call a strawberry that's depressed? Juicy? A blueberry. Uh, oh, no. All right, all right. <laughs> one more, one more. All right. I, I was at I was at this really emotional wedding and everybody was crying. Even the uh wedding cake was in tears. Oh my god, that was good. <laughs> tears. All right, all right. So, T I T I E R S tears. Yes, yes, very, very good. Very good, yes. very thank good, thank Rabbi. You for explaining it to those who get it. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate you doing all right. that. So uh, what was today's subject officially about? What did I say? Anybody remembers? What, did I write? what if godly emotions elude me? Elude you, good, good. So we're we're getting we're getting deep into the Tanya, which is all about emotions. So I'm going to mute everybody now, and uh, feel free to unmute yourself or put a uh, comment when you need to. Okay, of course, a couple more people still need to come. Um, let's start with this opening. Um, so I, I I probably talk half the time. Text is like I don't know third of the time or whatever. So. We're in a world today where emotions are king, right? I, I think it's probably a reaction to what went on for a long time where emotions were not king. But, you know, we're, we're in a world today where emotions are king. Emotions seem to dictate to people what they should do. It seems to be the morals, right? Now, it's a reaction. It's a reaction to the flip side of that, of what went on for many years, where people were just like, grow up, you know, do what you got to do, you know, just do it, or, or all types of lines like that. Um, whereas some people used to say, you know, I like my emotions like water. I like the bottled up, you know, so there's, there was, there was that going on for many years, you know, people bottle up their emotions. So, so now the pendulum swung the other way where emotions are king, where we kind of have to, you know, where we express our emotions to, to any extent. Um, so what, what is the healthy way, I guess, is the question that I'm going to pose to you. And of course I'll present it to Tanya. Well, what is the healthy way of, of dealing with emotions? Yes. You talk about talk about them. Talk about the emotions, okay. What do we do when there's a conflict with our emotions and our morals? Good question. That's when you call up the rabbi and say, "Do you have a couple <laughs> minutes?" Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, conflicted. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Get advice. Get advice. Okay. Go to go to your uh, you know leader, and sometimes it's a parent, not the rabbi. So can can emotions can emotions uh, dictate our morals, or should they? Shall I say? No. No, but do they often dictate how we act? Oh, oh yes, for, for sure, <laughs> for sure, for sure. So what's so what's the best best path going forward? To distinguish the difference. Is going back to the world where we ignored our emotions, is that the best? I mean, that seems to no. work. No, no. Why, why not? What's the problem with that? Well, first of all, that that that's a position of suppressing. Okay, but I mean we're it's, going, it's, we're it's more like wrong. well, it's more like survival. I mean, it's not it's not really digging into the uh uh what, what the background of it kind of like what what is causing it or, or you if know you, if you feel like murdering someone or stealing money shouldn't you suppress that <laughs> why don't we just use suppression our whole life just go with what we know is true based on our intellectual thoughts no no you you ask for for support Mm -hmm. Seth, what do you think? You know, suppression and some people get a lot of anxiety. And suppression has uh, has has other bad bad effects, other bad ill effects. I think awareness and insight can really be helpful. Awareness and an insight, an insight. Yeah, yeah. That's where I. That's where getting to the bottom of it. What what you know what what is bringing it up, right? You know? And when I think when you recognize it, you really have uh, more options open up to you 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 actually have different roads that you can go down which were not open to you when you're suppressing it right so suppression has a couple issues first of all it has bad side effects 
Uh, also, um, I think related to that same idea, it's not sustainable. Um, that was one of the points that Tanya made in the previous chapter. If you want a sustainable path in, say, serving God, uh, you want to be able to have emotions towards loving God and doing what he wants and having awe of him and staying away from what he doesn't want. Uh, a, a relationship with God that does not involve emotion is not a, a very long-term sustainable uh, mm -hmm. In addition to that, we spoke about, you know, that for technically it's not it's not called serving God if there's no emotion, there's no life in it. Just to tell a you know a story that, you know, again on the on that topic, as well as uh, it's obviously not a real story, but you know, the story is there's a husband and wife, they go to therapy, and uh, the wife is complaining that the husband never says, I love you. Right? So this is the old joke, right? So the husband says, Well, I told you under the under the wedding canopy, I love you, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. All right, but then the story continues, and uh, the wife says, well, he never gives me any presents. So the husband says, what do you need presents for? I love you. He says, but I, I would like presents. He's like, listen, I don't have any feeling towards presents. Presents don't mean anything to me. But if you really want presents, I'll get you presents. The next day, he comes into the house with his giant box, puts it down in the front of the house. He says, this box is full of lots and lots of presents. This should last you 20 years. Whenever you feel a need for a present, just go in there and take one. And of course, the wife starts crying even harder, because now th this... There's an action. There's no emotion to it. The present means absolutely nothing. It's a lifeless action. And that's really what we got into is uh, the Torah tells us we have to serve God. Serving God means serving God with our heart. Not just because um, that's what it says in the Shema. You shall serve the Lord your God with all your heart. What does it mean to serve God with your heart? That Not just you do the actions, but you have to have a service of God. You have to have an emotion in what you do. We'll expound on this idea even more about the importance of emotions, but uh, what, we're get, what I'm getting to is that in Judaism, emotion is important. It's not just about being able to force yourself to do what's right. You need to have emotions. Number one is, as we said, it's not sustainable not to have the emotions. Uh, you know, you bottle up your emotions of whatever else you want. It's not sustainable. And number two is part of serving God is to have emotions towards God. With all that being said, the Tanya basically delineates what is the way in which emotions work. The best way to do it is you start off with your mind. It get, gets to your heart, then it gets to action, right? So when it comes to, let's say, people, let's talk about our relationships with people. Uh, the way we understand and know the people around us affects our emotions towards them. Let's say there's somebody that you hate, you really can't stand. And then one day you find out that behind the scenes, this same person has been, uh, you know, spending all their time behind the curtains, making your life better. There's actually even stories about it. There's stories, uh, you know, ancient stories were told in communities where there was a, a community miser who was known to give no money. And then one day he dies and everybody finds out that actually behind the scenes, he was giving money to the baker and the butcher and they were all giving free money to all the poor people in town. So suddenly you have the feelings towards this miser has gone from hatred to love and admiration. And, and so again, here we see that the way we have our relationships to people is based on our interpretation of them, really based on our interpretation, not only understanding, but also interpretation, uh, right? There's facts, and then there's how you interpret those facts. Um, it's the narrative that we have. So that's why it's so important that uh, if we want to have this emotional relationship with God, it says the time you start at the mind. You start at the mind, and you start with meditation. Well, really, it's actually, I should say, it starts with study. You have to have topics to study about. You can't meditate if you can't have anything in your mind. Now, I know there's meditation in the world, which is called emptying your mind. That's not the Jewish meditation. Maybe that might be a prerequisite to meditate, but it's not actual meditation because you're not meditating about something that's getting you to a, to a place, that's getting you to an emotional state. All right, that, that has its place, but meditation, as we're talking about, is meditating about something. And in this case, it's meditating about God. Now, any thoughts? If you were to meditate about God, what would you meditate about? If you wanted to create feelings towards God. Any any thoughts? What meditations would you meditate on? Yes. Well, it's oh, go ahead, Emmy. Uh I don't know about meditation, but I will I like to read and that always, always helps me. Like I, I read a book. There are there are amazing books that are like that are there to help you uh restore your faith in God. Um like I like this book, The Garden of Emuna, and I have Garden of Emuna, right? Yes, yeah, I have read this book many times in my life since a long time ago, and I am reading it again. So, and it's always 
it always helped me. So that's what I do. I, I don't do yoga and any, any that that kind of stuff that doesn't do anything for me. I mean, meditation doesn't have to be yoga. Um, I'll just differentiate between reading a book and meditation. Uh, and I'll give an example from the business world. Um, let's say you're running a business, you know, you're a self entrepreneur or whatever it is. And the business, business world is very hard. Business world is very difficult. And so what you're doing is you're reading a book, a self-help book about business, and it has tons of good ideas. And as you read them, you might get flirts of excitement. You might get a moment of saying, wow, that idea is so amazing. That idea will really help my business. That idea will really change things. But that is not really going to change uh, your business per se. You'll get moments of inspiration. You then have to take a item of that book and think about it. You got to take it, think about it, contemplate about it. And that's what I'm saying meditation. At not just reading a book and getting lots of ideas, which is, which is good and give you moments of excitement. And I suspect as well, when you read the Garden of Amuna, you not just read the book, but then you there's a topic in the book that then you think about and like, wow. And then you think about how, how it applies in your life, how it applies in, you know, in your day-to-day -day actions. That's what I mean by meditation. Whereas reading a book can be just, uh, you know, uh, consuming material and it will inspire you momentarily for sure. But meditation is more than that. Meditation doesn't have to be yoga. That's why I'm, I'm trying to differentiate Jewish meditation. It means taking any item and thinking about it consciously and, and focusing on that so that it can change how you feel. Yes, Ahava. So I would say like to do that for myself, sometimes I do like the 13 attributes of mercy. Sometimes the six remembrances at the end of davening you could just take one of those and you could just really think about it, like just pull it apart and just, just take it as it is. You know, I don't have to read much more into it, but let it like, in a sense, uh, you know, you open your mind and you say, you know what, I really want to, you know, connect to Hashem and I want to grow. I think it's a general desire to grow. So it's more depth than breath is, I guess, what I want to say. Right. right. The, other, the other thing and how it applies to you, the other thing I would say is a lot of times we can get excited about concepts the first time we hear about them. And it's exciting in order to maintain that. And again, I suspect, uh, Esmeralda, when you're reading these books, you are contemplating about it. Maybe you wouldn't call it meditation because you think meditation is yoga. But what I'm saying is meditation in, in this context really just means taking any topic and thinking about it and how it applies to you in your life consciously. Oh, absolutely. Like, that is the idea. What is the point of reading a book and you just right, don't right. do anything about it? Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and you say, okay, so you do meditate. Just maybe you wouldn't have called it meditation. <laughs> okay, Adam, yes, what do you want to say? You got something you wanted to say? Uh, well, Esmeralda kind of said a lot of it. Um, You know, it's, it's from, for me, it's kind of like where I stand. Uh, I'm not looking to improve anything because i am whole perfect and complete god has made me that way you know so being that you know things are just fine how they are i you know i look for things that might be missing okay so those are the things that i always ask for you know what am i missing what what's not there what could i put into place that would make a difference and that's that's what i would meditate on is where can i make a difference but I, I'm I'm specifically asking. I mean, that's that's an important meditation too. Specifically asking if you, where would you meditate in ways that would um, foster your love or awe of God? Yeah, it's I it, for me it's it lives out beyond me. You know, it's it it's in my conversations with other people. It's like being here in a class and talking about things like this with others. You know, it's not. For me, it's not always reading uh, and trying to discover something new that somebody has wrote about. It's more like talking with somebody and, um, you know, getting input, getting insight as what Seth said, insight into something that I might be missing or where I can apply myself somewhere or where I can benefit somebody else. So I always look for what I can do for other people as opposed to right but so 
Okay, but as it pertains to Tanya or, or the, you know, yeah, is is you need to have. It's your love of God that inspires you mm -hmm. to reach out to the world. It's your love of God that inspires you to make that difference. My question to you is: So, how are you fostering your love of God? <laughs> and I, I hear what you're saying, and you're not entirely wrong because there is there is another way of working this which is going from the action and then leading backwards, which I'm going to talk in my class. Tomorrow. Yeah, no, I, it's I hear a, what you're saying. Kind of like our first conversation was like, I'm sharing what, you know, things that people tell me and my love for my faith, my love for my people, my love for myself, you know, and maybe, you know, there's, seeing, there's definitely a thing that helping people will help you, you know, I mean, you know, it's obvious. absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it's, if, if I pick, but, like that, but that being said, we, we all are supposed to spend every every day, you know, some time praying. So. Yeah, I know. I mean, for like uh, some people, they put that in the structure of their life. Like this period of time from like 7 to 8 o'clock a.m. are prayers, you know, and uh, for others, it's it's something different. You know, for me, it's uh, just being out of the house or on the phone talking with somebody about what I discovered today. Uh, you know, what, what kind of, what, what sharing my studies, you know, sharing what I learned out of the Torah. So what, you, what you need, what you need is, is yeshiva style study where you study with someone else. Yeah. I mean, if I could, if <laughs> I could, study. Okay. Yeah, if I, could, if, I, I, if I was yeah. younger and I could afford to go to yeshiva, yeah. I would have, you know, yeah. But, uh, you know, different, different reasons. I mean, I wasn't in love with God at the time. So, yeah. yeah. So now I've discovered, you know, more of myself because in this last two years of coming back, coming to Chabad and discovering right. what Chabad is, you know, a new world has opened up for me. And mm -hmm. uh, here right. I am. So, so let's sum up what we've said, or at least the Tanya's worldview on emotions is my, is, is we've said earlier that, that we have the ability to override our emotions. You know, the being me has the ability. We can always choose to do the right thing, but long-term it's not the best path. So the best path forward is according to the Tanya, as it says, the way to serve God, and we call it serving God, right? We had the whole chapter before we said, if you don't bring emotions in, you're not serving God. So the way to serve God is you work in your mind, you work that affects your feelings in your heart. So again, you meditate in your mind, affects your feeling in your heart, and that will bring to the actions that will express your emotions. We also discussed earlier that in scenarios where your emotions are, for whatever reason, not aligned, you know, they're not they're not good. You do always have the ability to uh, follow what your mind says is correct, and then so that that answers, you know, the problem we started off the class with. You know what do we do when our mind and heart are not attached? You know when our when our when our heart when our emotions are, are off base. That's why we started off a couple chapters ago where we said at the end of the day you always have the ability to make the right choice whether your emotions are there or not. But the most ideal is to get your emotions in the right place. So we have two things we're working on simultaneously. Number one is we have to know what's correct and and try to make the decisions to do the right things. At the same time, we want to uh, work on our meditation and our emotions to help make those decisions easier. Does that make sense? So that would yeah. be, I would say, the, you know, the Tanya's worldview on emotions is that emotions are good. You should have emotions, but even when emotions are not in place, we want to, um, uh, you can make the right choices at that moment. Correct. So emotions aren't king. Emotions are a tool. And emotions are a tool that we should use. Make sense? Right. Okay. And yeah. Rabbi, sometimes when you, let's say you just feel that uh, I, I want to do this, but then you realize that's not the right thing to do. And then you do the right thing. Even though you suppressed your emotion, then later on, you can realize that that was the right thing to do and you feel good about it. Very good. Sometimes emotion can come after the fact of doing the right thing. That's something, like I said, we're going to talk about tomorrow, tomorrow night's class, but I'll, I'll give the spoiler now to an extent. Is that, yeah, some, you know, Judaism is not just learn from the book. You have to act on it sometimes in order to get the feeling towards it. Just maybe connect with what Adam was saying earlier. You know, in some ways you can meditate all day about uh, giving charity. Yeah. But if you actually give charity, it'll give you a feeling that, you know, meditation about charity may not give you, you know, so uh, Judaism is definitely not just learned out of a book. It's experienced. Right. 
but nevertheless, the study can always enhance. And I, and I would add is that a lot of times the action helps in the beginning, but at a certain point, you'll need to study about it as well. You, you know, especially especially the godly actions, I would say, you know, to fill in and, you know, certain things that are very human and enjoyable. You know, Shabbat, you could probably go your whole life not studying about Shabbat and enjoy it, you know, because it's enjoyable. But, you know, if you study about it, I would say you enjoy it more, uh, have more meaning. But, you know, but but things that are more, you know, the mitzvahs that are more between us and God, uh, they're definitely after the first couple of times, you know, let's say you put on tefillin, you know, after the hundredth time, you probably want to study about it uh, in order to give you some type of feeling towards it. Um, so I would say, yeah, it really depends on the type of commandment, the type of mitzvah. Um, okay, so let's take a look inside the Tanya, where the Tanya will um, tell us about exactly what we just said. It's on page, uh, what page is this? It's the first page. It's chapter 16. It's page 188. 188, where it says when meditation fails, although the beginning is not about when meditation fails. So he's going to sum up what uh, what we've said in the previous chapters. And we're in chapter 16. So like this. In chapter, so this is the commentary. In chapter 12 to 14, the Tanya is offered as a very detailed insight into the Bainani. The Bainani is us, which is presented as the realistic religious ideal for every person. When it comes to practical observance, Bainani is a great success but he struggles to maintain a steady emotional attachment to God. His feelings fluctuate between utter rapture when his prayers and meditations go well to thoughts of selfish, animalistic behavior, which may bother him much of the time. Sounds like us, except I'm not sure if we all get to the rapture. <laughs> uh, the Tanya reassures us that all this is quite normal when it comes to practical observance, both between man and God and between man and his fellow. We should expect nothing less than total self-control. Now, I'm just going to read into that. It's within our ability to have total self-control. Now, it's technically we could have total self-control. But the emotional ride is going to be a roller coaster. Most of us will spend our lives with conflicting urges, a longing to worship God alongside a desire to be selfish. When this range of feelings surfaces, it should not be caused to alarm. The solution proposed by Italian is to focus on the positive and stir up as much love and reverence for God as possible to make as many deposits in our next page, emotional bank account as we can, since the animal soul, which can never really be changed, will always pull us towards selfishness. We need to ensure that there is a strong pull in other direction towards God. And the way to do that, in Tanya's view, is through prolonged and regular mindful meditation. So that's what we said. Again, we're not, we're never assured to have the right emotions, but you got to keep making emotional bank account deposits. How? By doing regular prolonged mindful meditation. For Bain and Nim, those who seek to become Bain and Nim, and again, it's us, not to delve into the, the label, the worship of God has this one all-encompassing principle. The main thing is to dominate and control the natural tendencies of the animal soul in the heart's left chambers. The all-encompassing principle is you must wrestle with your nature and seek to control it. And again, how do we control it? Not just by forcing it, but by working on our emo godly emotions. And as we said earlier, the animal soul is not a um, the animal soul is not bad. It's animalistic. So when you contemplate and meditate about God, it might come along for the ride because it might say, you know, today it's, right. that sounds like a good idea. It's an animal soul. It's not an evil soul. It's an animal soul. Right. Right. So as we saw in chapter 15, it's possible to have impeccable religious behavior and not be at war with the animal soul, either due to decreased passions or persistent discipline. That's not enough to worship God. Even if your animal soul has been tamed and trained to behave impeccably in a certain area, you need to break your nature and do more. Right. So that was something else we explained. We explained, let's say, let's, let's take Shabbat, for example. Your animal soul might be along for certain aspects of Shabbat, the enjoyable parts of Shabbat. But then if you never work in the aspects of Shabbat that you don't enjoy yet, then you're not serving God because you're only doing what's comfortable for you. Service of God means right. doing something that's uncomfortable. And so this is what he's saying here is that you can be someone who uh, maybe does everything right. But what you need to do is always push yourself. Once you're comfortable in a certain area, push yourself to the next area. That's what it means to serve God, to, to go into the areas that are uncomfortable to you, for you. So even if you've got the animal soul to go along with the ride, someone says all parts of Shabbat are enjoyable. Um, um, I don't know. 
Maybe uh, we have to study some of the laws of Shabbat. You'll find out. <laughs> I, I assure you, there are parts of Shabbat that might have you pulling up, you know. Ah, you know. Trust me. Um, okay. You are not expected to transfer your animal soul to be friend, to be your friend in worship. You just need to dominate and control its nature so you can worship God. Okay. How is this achieved? Through the divine light which shines upon your divine soul that rests in the brain. So again, let's go back to our discussion earlier. We said your godly soul mostly rests in your brain and in the right side of your heart. Your animal soul is in the left side of your heart because the left side of your heart has lots of blood, lots of passion, lots of emotion. As we learn in chapters 12, 13, the eights are impulsive might trouble the being one of two ways. Number one, if he has complete mental focus to follow God's will, when urges arise from the eights are right, it is relatively easy to diffuse them since the brain rules over the heart. So again, that was one way of controlling the animal soul is by forcing it. Or number two, sometimes even when the baby is uninspired, the Yetzirah can send him in a state of mental confusion and he is unsure whether or not he wishes to follow God's will. It is this point when the baby's inner flame is at the weakest and a struggle is the greatest, but God offers him assistance in the form of light that shines upon the divine soul to rest in the brain. This is why the baby is always able to control his behavior, even the darkest of moments. So again, we said generally we have the ability to control our animal soul if we really want to. And sometimes... We have trouble controlling our animal soul because we're confused. That was a discussion we had in chapter 13, is that the hardest thing in life is our confusion, when we're not sure what we really want. That's what makes it hardest to forge ahead and do the right thing. And at that moment, we have to pray to God, really, because confusion is a lot. Anyways, but all this is, the point is that ultimately it's the mind going to the heart and to use the mind to, to rule over the heart. Let me just go to the next page. Um, next page. While the Benini can expect God's assistance in times of confusion, it is preferable for him to rely on that. If he is able to retain sufficient mental focus and the awareness that he wishes to follow God's will, he can rely on the mind's natural tendency to rule over the heart. This mental focus, however, does not come without the necessary preparations of meditation and prayer. <laughs> So he says, this happens through mindful meditation of the greatness of God's blessed light so that your powers of being and cognition give rise to the spirit of dust, recognition and reverence of God in your mind. So again, just to recap, this goes back to something he explained within the, the mental uh, meditation of God. There's three stages in our mind. Number one is when we, number one is called Chachma, wisdom. When we first get a, uh, when we first get a uh, understanding about God, so it's that, that flash of inspiration. Number two is um, number two is when we have when we contemplate the topic deeply, and number three is when that idea that we've thought about deeply then um, finds its way into our heart. These three stages are important to know to note and talk about. I'll tell you why, because we're going to talk about it soon. And that is that um, I think this goes back to the example I said earlier, right? If you read a book with good ideas, right? So when you're reading that book of good ideas, say the business, you read a good idea like, wow, you got the idea. That's called Chachma, wisdom. Wisdom is not cognition as he calls Bina, or I, I call it understanding. Wisdom is, wisdom is that flash of inspiration. Wow, you know, it's that light bulb that goes up in your head. That can go nowhere. That, that can go absolutely nowhere. It's just a a, 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 a a light bulb shining in your brain. Then you need to spend the time contemplating about it. That's called the Bina, the cognition, or I call it understanding, the meditation about the topic, seeing how it applies to your life. In the business, seeing how it applies in your life. Um, in, in our service of God, seeing how God is relevant in your life. But then there's the final step in our mind, and that's called Das. Das is that bridge between our mind and our heart. In uh, in, a chassid, in Kabbalistic terminology, they actually compare it to like the, the neck. It says there's like our head, which is big, and then there's the neck, which is smaller. And that signifies that it's hard to get items from our brain to our heart 
there's it's what's called the the narrowness of the neck. You know, our, our bodies are built. This is what by this is what it means when it says in the uh, in in the Torah when it says, "Let us make man in our image." The Kabbalists actually explain that our body actually resembles our spiritual reality. And so this is just one example of that, where the neck symbolizes the difficulty of getting from our minds to our hearts. I mean, how many people here have trouble uh, with emotion? And I, when I say emotion, I mean creating emotion, right? I, I would put myself there as well. Uh, now, some people are very emotional. They get emotional at everything, and God bless them. And then, of course, they have the opposite problem where they have to rein in their emotion. But uh, many of us have grown up, at, you know, maybe not the newest generation, I'm not sure, but many of us have grown up, you know, with the bottling emotions, right? And uh, it creates a difficulty in being able to foster the emotions. And uh, so a lot of us have that great difficulty in creating that bridge between our mind and, and our heart. And that's the final stage. That's what's called das. Das means recognition. Uh, it's when it's when that knowledge that you have affects how you feel and how you act. Another example we've given many times is um, you have medical professionals. Medical professionals who definitely understand the effects of certain actions, yet choose not to do them. There were many, there are many medical professionals who still smoke. Today, maybe less than there was 10 years ago. But the knowledge that the doctors had about the danger of smoking was out there. Well, if you, especially if you go to Israel, you know, all those ready doctors that smoke, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, but even in America, right? You have people that smoke. So the knowledge of, of, of what it does does not necessarily affect how we feel and how we act. And um, that's the problem. That's the problem that we as, as humanity face. And this is what the time is going to deal with next. But in an ideal world, you have the light bulb, the idea. You have the deep contemplation, cognition, understanding of the topic. And then finally, you can pull it down in a level of what he calls recognition, or you might call it intimacy. And I'll tell you why I'm going to use the word intimacy. In in uh, the Torah, in the beginning of the Torah, when in, when it's, in, in Genesis, when it talks about the... the uh, intimate relations between Adam and Eve, it actually uses this word das, knowledge, because that that denotes a, a, a great a merging, a connection of two opposite things, an intimate relationship. And the same thing is with us, is our mind and our hearts are really very, you know, the opposite. The, the, the heart is warm, the heart is fiery, passionate, the mind is calm, cool, collected, analytical. And uh, to create this intimacy between those two, it's not easy. It takes, it takes effort, real effort. And because of that, as we'll see soon, uh, it doesn't always work. But let, let's continue here, assuming it works, because now he's talking about the ideal situation. The ideal situation is to serve God with your heart. So you go through the three levels of your mind, you know, the, the light bulb, and the cognition, and then the ultimate, the final level of your mind, which, which connects you with your emotions. And that will bring you, as he says in a paragraph, that reverence of God and Das enables you to make firm decisions to turn away from evil, from Psalms, to avoid any prohibition biblically or rabbinically, right? So again, if you feel a reverence towards God, you're not going to do anything that will uh, go against him. And down to even a minor rabbinic prohibition, God forbid, right? If you if you feel strongly in your heart every single moment, the great reverence of God, uh, you're unlikely to uh, do anything that he doesn't like, just as in any other relationship. If you feel a great uh, reverence or awe or or love, whatever, you know, to your spouse, you're unlikely to do anything against them in that moment. If you do, it's likely that your emotions have gone into hiding. In addition to reverence, a fear of distancing yourself from God through transgression, your meditation is generating positive feelings of love. All right, so he's saying in addition to reverence your meditation should generate the love of God. And love of God will be generated in your heart in its right chamber where the divine soul rests with fervor and desire to attach yourself to him. So love means you want to attach yourself. If you love some someone, you want to attach yourself to them. You want to be connected with them. You want to be connected to that whom you love. That's why... Uh, People have sports titles. They, 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 they get their memorabilia. They wear their shirts with their names on it. 
are they wearing because they think suddenly they'll they'll play like them? No, they but they want to they want to make some type of connection. They're doing some action to create some type of connection. Now, if you can actually create a connection with any of these people, that's that's even greater, right? And um, connection, what one form of connection is acts of service. Just as an, I mean, you know, I'm sure you know the five languages of love or whatever it is, but one of those is acts of service. And so mitzvahs is uh, one of the ways that we can connect and attach and, and become closer to God. Uh, so let's read here through observing the biblical and rabbinic mitzvahs and the study of Torah, which is equal to all of them. Uh, okay. For detailed meditations, see below chapter 41 to 50. And that's why I keep saying uh, the Tanya will delve more deeply into the specific meditations. But here he's giving you the general idea. If you want to serve God, you need to meditate about God. When you meditate about God, you'll have reverence toward God, which means you will not do something that you know that he doesn't like. And you will love God, which means you will do things that he does like. All right. Uh, someone says all we have to do is join Chabad and we have all these three qualities. Correct. It's correct because that's what actually Chabad means. Chabad is actually an acronym for these three stages in our mind. It is uh, the Chachma, the wisdom, the light bulb, the Bina, the cognition, understanding. And then there's the dot, that level that connects us. So uh, now you know what Chabad is about. This is exactly what Chabad is about. That's why I always tell people Chabad is both a philosophy and a movement. And uh, they're both interconnected. And many of the things that we do as a movement are connected to our philosophy. Um, but the basic of the Chabad philosophy is having a relationship with God that involves our feelings. I want to say one important thing about that is that there were streams of Judaism that did not focus on feelings. And you can sustain that for a while. But when it, when push comes to shove, I mean, in other words, when, when does the difference between that type of Judaism come out is when times get tough. Um, you know, during the great persecution of Jewry during the Soviet Union, last 80 years, right? From 1927 or something, right? Till 1989. Uh, most streams of, of uh, traditional religious Judaism uh, disappeared from the Soviet Union. Obviously, some of it was immigration, but some of it was just squashed out. And they say, on a whole, the only two streams that remained was Chabad and Breslov. Now, Breslov, obviously, we know focuses a lot on emotions. And Chabad, which some people don't know, but Chabad also focuses on emotions. And um, you need to have, uh, or the same thing, you know, a lot of it, when Judaism came to America, when it was difficult, you know, some of the streams of Judaism, you know, sheltered themselves in, I don't want to call them ghettos, but, you know, little, little towns, and that's how they, they retained it. But, um, you know, if you want to maintain your... Um, Judaism, you need to have the emotional part of it. When Chabad first started sending Chabad emissaries all over the world, many of the uh, other streams of Judaism couldn't believe it. Orthodox, I should say. They, they couldn't imagine that you could take an Orthodox Jew, you know, plop them in the middle of nowhere with no other religious Jews around them, and they would have remained religious. It was something that nobody could believe that could happen. And, and don't forget, the world was less connected. You know, today... You know, it's, it's much easier, you know, because you, you feel connected with your family and friends. You get on Zoom calls. Everybody knows what you're doing on, on social media. You're much more connected. But back in the day, you could do whatever you want and nobody would know what's going on. But but that is a testament to the power of this philosophy. Um, if you just feel like you're forcing yourself to do the actions, um, it's not going to remain. It's not going to stay. That's why a lot of the uh, a lot of Jews grew up, uh, you know, shall we say we talk about, you know, hitting the the ancient Hebrew school. I was actually talking to a mother, you know, just the other day, and she was telling me she was sending her kid to some Hebrew school somewhere. And like how her kid just hated it. Like it's not something that, you know, she wants her kid to go to. You want we want to have an emotional connection with our Judaism. If there's no emotional connection, if it's forced, it doesn't stay. And that is uh, the model that Chabad gives us. And Chabad tells us that emotions 
the best type of emotions are not ones that are based on external trappings, right? You can create, you can create an aura for emotions, right? So I would say most people have an emotional connection to past verb, let's say, right? Because there's a, you know, there's an aura about it. There's something exciting that, you know, there's the food, the, the bitter herbs and the matzah and the wine. Creates an aura. You know, you, you can get away with people keeping Passover for the rest of their lives because they'll be emotionally connected to it. But Judaism on a whole, if you want to have people be connected to Judaism, you need to um, start with education. Obviously, education in a good way, you know, allowing people to ask questions and, and delve deeply into the topics. But... Um, we start with education. As we said here, it starts in the mind. It gets to the heart. People want to understand what they're doing. Uh, people want to connect with the actions that they're doing. And that's exactly what the Tanya is advocating for. If you want to uh, love doing a mitzvah, you want to have feelings towards God. And you can understand, you can study about the mitzvah itself. That's good. That's good too. But ultimately, you want to have love towards God himself. That's the whole reason you're doing a mitzvah. Mitzvah means it's a commandment from God. Well, what, why would you want to do it if you have no feelings towards God? You can force yourself to do it for a certain amount of time, but ultimately you're going to want to create feelings towards God. With all that being said, Tanya is going to have a problem. And the problem is that uh, many of us have trouble with feelings. Many of us have trouble with feelings. So what do we do then? What do you do? Any thoughts? Anybody here has trouble with feelings? Am I alone over here? You can unmute. Yes, Adam. <laughs> well, I mean, my my, I didn't know it. You know, I didn't know it. I mean, I just uh, for many many years, I put myself in a position of like doing good for people, but not being emotionally connected to it. Right. Yeah. And so that's who I was. And it's like, oh, yes, I'm a good person. But um, what I found out was that connection wasn't there. Right. Somebody would talk to me and then I would forget, you know, what did it, what was it? And so then there was something where, the, you know, it was pointed out to me. And it, the question was why? And, and, you know, going deep into you know, meditating as to, you know, why am I like that? You mm -hmm. know, I discovered that I was connected to something that I, I considered to be important Why totally missing all that. So yeah, there was that. And so I deal with that all the time. I deal with that uh, uh, every day. It's like a, from moment to moment. Right. So you know, what's it's, interesting is that Tanya, uh, I like what you're saying. I'm gonna, I want to expound on that. You're giving, you have a human reason that you've discovered why you don't feel emotion. Yeah, right. something, somebody said something to me or I did something and, you know, then I became that. Right. So the Tanya is going to talk about emotion, people that don't feel emotions. It's even going to give a mystical reason for it based on the root of your soul. Ah. But the way I understand it is like this. Some people don't feel emotions truly because of some mystical reason. And then there's some mystical reason, and you'll read the Tanya, and I'll tell you what to do if there's a mystical reason you're not feeling emotions. But I also believe, we'll see you as Meralda. Um, oh, dentist. Um, but um, there's a lot of times the reason people aren't feeling emotion has nothing to do with uh, anything spiritual. They phys they don't feel physical emotion in general. They don't, they have trouble with emotions with their friends. They have trouble with emotions with their family. They have trouble with emotions with everybody. It's very common, right? And and so what I'm trying to say is that the Tanya is going to come at it from a religious angle. But I think sometimes the reason people aren't, are, are going to meditate and not feel feelings towards God is not an issue in their meditation of God. <laughs> it's a life issue that they need to maybe go to therapist for to work on feeling emotion in general. So again, the Tanya is going to give a mystical reason. And I think that may apply you know, very specifically for meditations towards God. But I think if, if you see you're having trouble with emotions in general, before we, you know, you get to the Tanya and what it says here, you might also want to see a therapist or, or, or I don't know, therapist, however you want to tackle the problem. But if it's a general life problem that you have, and like you said, it's very common, 
Uh, and like I said, I think the, 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 the reason is, is, you know, a lot of us have grown up being told to bottle up our emotions. Sometimes, you know, sometimes, by the way, I like to Google search things, you know, you can see a lot of things on forums and seeing what people write. And then a lot of people say the same sentiment, you know, we've been told, you know, showing emotion, you know, is weak, it displays weakness. And so therefore a lot of people bottle up their emotions their entire lives. And then they come to try and pray or they read the Tanya and it tells you, you got to meditate about God. And then they wonder why they're not feeling anything. And it's, it's nothing, it's not a religious problem. It's, it's a human problem that you're having right now that you just don't feel emotion. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is, is that if you have a physical problem, you might need to heal at the physical plane uh, before you try and take the Tanya's advice. Uh, you need to figure out how to, you know, what's wrong. Why are you not feeling emotions in general? But if you do generally feel emotion, you don't feel emotions towards God, then we can have, you know, then there's a, then that's a separate discussion. But that's, I wanted to make that, make that distinction clear. Yeah. I just, um, I didn't know it was a problem. That's the thing, you know, not being emotional. Was that a problem? You know, I, I didn't know that. It's just like when it, when I discovered it, it was like a light. Well, well let, let's break, let's break it down. Why is it a problem? And the Tanya will obviously tell you it's a problem, but why is ah. it? I don't know. I don't. I don't think it is a problem. I think it's just so, and uh, we always have the opportunity to be, you know, to be emotional, to to take it on. I could share a story, but I'm not sure if that. When, when, well, I'll tell you. Is it, it'll be next week's Tanya discussion, but I'll tell you my theory about the issue of not having emotions. What do we call somebody when they do something without emotion? Going back to the beginning story of the of the husband and wife. When he when he puts out the present, she can pick any presents. What's the problem with that type of present? What do we call it? We call it soulless. It's soulless. There's no soul in it. What we're gonna discuss more at length next week. Is that feelings are the gateway for the connection between our soul and our body. That's why when someone has emotions, it feels soulful. When someone sings, you feel their soul in it. When the emotion isn't something, it's an interesting thing. Then we'll explain more why next week. But feelings allow the expression of your soul. The body is physical. The soul is spiritual. But through feelings, we enable the soul to have expression within our body. And therefore, it's so important to allow feelings, to allow the expression of your soul, which is the real you in your life. Yeah. Absolutely. Somebody 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 told me that it was a practice, right? Being emotional. When you do exercises to get in touch with your emotions, um, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And, uh, but and, I, and, I, I'm not a mental health professional, so I, I'm everybody's gonna have a different story about why they're not feeling emotion and how they should get to it. Yeah. But the one thing I will say is it's something that we should all work on actively. However, yeah. you do it and however you go about it, if you're having trouble with emotions, see, is it, is it a general issue or is it just Judaism specific? It's a general issue. That's something you have to tackle. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's just read a couple more lines here and then we'll end off for, for the day. Um, so he says like this, but there is an additional second all encompassing principle of worship for the Bainan that you need to know. Central to the religious life of the Bainan is the ability to generate real feelings for God through meditation. But what happens if you employ all the correct techniques and despite all your efforts, strong feelings don't come? It says like this. The additional principle tells you how to react if even doing all the appropriate meditations, your intellectual capacity and cognitive focus prove insufficient to generate a love of God tangibly in your heart, that your heart should burn like a flaming fly fire and desire intensely with a palpable desire craving and longing your heart to attach yourself to him. So that's a long way, way of saying, what happens if the emotions are not coming? So again, you carry out all the meditations advised by the Tanya at length, trying your best to generate a powerful excitement for God, but it doesn't happen. Rather, the love remains concealed and stuck in your brain and in your hidden places in your heart, i.e. your heart does feel it, but is in a less excited, muted fashion. So now I am going to, so he says, it makes sense to, to you to worship God, but you just don't feel hungry for it, i.e. your mind inquiring your recognition of God's infinite blessed greatness does register in your heart, and your heart recognizes that in its presence, everything is considered zero, but you don't really have feelings. And there's a recognition of your heart, but not a feeling. I want to read the footnote at the bottom of the page, because I told you I would give you the, the, the mystical reason why you might not feel feelings. So it says like this. In this note, the tiny explains that a failure to generate powerful emotions for God's meditation need not be the result of poor meditation technique. It may just be that your soul is not cut out for it. 
and the reason for this failure to generate palpable emotions for God through meditation, even when the meditation is carried out correctly. Let's go to the next page. Is because a person's brain energy and a soul energy of an effort basic functioning, ruach, emotional powers, and a some intellectual powers do not empower with the ability to do so. What exactly is lacking in the person's brain and soul energy that prevent them from carrying out a successful meditation resulting in tangible emotions? So again, I'm just reading quickly because it's a long-winded way of saying it. I mean, if you know the Kabbalah, it's important. But anyways, because his brain and the soul energies and their soul source derive from the world of emotion as it exists in a state of gestation. So again, oh, what's the difference between pregnancy and birth? Is in pregnancy, the child is hidden. Everything might be there, but the child is hidden inside and uh, it's not there. So the Kabbalists compared the process of thought generating emotion to gestation followed by birth. Right? It actually says that, that, that the emotions are the children of the brain. You give birth to emotions. In the world of emotion, there are both undeveloped gestational emotions and those that are fully mature born. This person's soul is rooted in the gestation energy, which is why he has difficulty, a difficult time in giving birth to a real emotion. Gestation energy is from the emotionally muted discernment process and not from the realm of emotional birth and disclosure. The reason why this person's meditations are not producing emotions might be because the soul is rooted in a cerebral energy discernment where emotions are still gestating and not been born as in the capitalist. So he's giving a technical capitalistic reason there might be Kabbalistic reasons why you don't feel emotion it might be in gestation. I want to say like this. I want to say that um, even if you do not have that extreme level, it sounds like here this type of person will like never really have powerful emotions. What this does explain to me, and that's why I like the Kabbalah so much, it gives mystical reasons why certain things are the way they are. There are some people who are naturally and have the ability to be more emotional than others. In other words, I said earlier, some of us may not feel emotion because we have a general life issue, but it, it's possible even when we work on our emotions, my emotions may only be this and someone else may feel that emotional. Emotions are different between, between people. And Tanya is giving you a reason. It depends on the root of your soul. Our souls come from different roots, different levels of gestation, different levels of birth, how that emotion is born. Our souls come from different roots. And that's why we should never compare ourselves to other people. Some people... I may look at someone and say, wow, look at that person's emotional, you know, I, I know people who like are so emotional about Judaism. And I have to tell myself, I'm not trying to be that. I'm never going to be that. That's how that person is born. That's the ability that they have. I have to focus on the emotional capabilities that I have because the root of my soul is in one place. And this is what the time is telling you. In some cases, your level of emotional energy is completely based on where your soul is. So don't try to be someone else. And in the case of this extreme case, this person will never have, you know, palpable emotion. Okay. Most of us are never going to be that extreme case, but whatever level of emotion that we can have, we have to accept that's what God is giving us based on the root of our souls. And therefore stop looking at other people and always focus as, as, as we've discussed many times, always focus on our abilities. So uh, to sum up what we said today, is uh, we, we start off with a discussion of what emotions and their role in our service of God and how emotions are important, yet we don't let emotions rule us. And the, the best case scenario is to use our mind to give birth to our emotions to ultimately lead us to a more fulfilling and connected uh, Judaism. And um, we ended off describing that there are some people who will have trouble with emotions. Sometimes it's a human issue, you need to deal with the human issue but sometimes it is a spiritual issue and to just recognize that we all have different capacities for emotion that may be God given. Uh, we have to get to the best level of emotion that we can ourselves. Next week, we're going to delve further into uh, what we do if we have trouble with emotions and what the time suggestion is. And we'll stop the recording now.